my boots on and lace them up. A hard work. Got another day to work. A hard work. Hard work. The title I chose is more activity or less inactivity uh, to oppose cardiometabolic disease. And I'm glad that uh, one of the former speakers talked about these uh, interrelationships between diseases because talking about diabetes, you can't not talk about cardiovascular disease. Talking about cardiovascular disease, you can't not talk about diabetes. They're so intricately related um, that most people with diabetes don't die of diabetes, they die of cardiovascular disease. So, uh, our lab mission, which uh, has started in 2000 and continues today, uh, is to uh, understand how uh, physical activity, diet, and pharmacology can best be integrated to reverse insulin resistance uh, and prevent type 2 diabetes. Uh, we do other studies. We do some things related to appetite regulation and exercise. We do some things currently related to ADD, ADHD medications and exercise, but this is the heart of what we do, or as we like to say, it's not very funny, the pancreas of what we do. Um, uh, so this is the scope of the diabetes epidemic. Um, and uh, just as an example of the way different ways of portraying data can show people different things, um, these, the entire population or the diabetes, people with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, 18, 19 million people, uh, comprises the entire population of all of those states, uh, which makes it seem like a very, very big problem. But you could present exactly the same number uh, in a very different way. Um, it's also just half the population of California. So depending on how, whether you think that's a big number or not, I mean, in one case, it looks like a widespread epidemic. In this case, it looks like it's confined to an area that most people in the country don't really care about anyway. Um, <laughs> but it really, the way you express the data, of course, really can express and show your bias and also um, inflict biases on other people. Um, so this is dwarfed, or these 19 million people with diabetes are dwarfed by the 79 million, pe million people with prediabetes, uh, people who, as we say somewhat jokingly, are one Big Mac away from diabetes. Um, and that is a number that could be expressed as uh, take everyone in the United States who's left-handed, I'm one of them, uh, and Jewish, and take all the people with Jewish, 6 million people, uh, 30 million people, 43 million households that own dogs, um, that's the number of people who have prediabetes. So again, that might seem like a really big number to you, or it might not, depending on whether you think that's, you know, this is a lot of people or not. The key to all this, to really cardiovascular disease and diabetes, is really an underlying biochemical theme. Uh, and that really is insulin resistance, uh, which some people call syndrome X or metabolic syndrome. Um, but it's all wrapped around this idea that there's this common physiological problem that really explains a lot of the connection between obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So this is the part where it gets fun for me. Uh, <laughs> insulin resistance. Uh, so here's the cartoon. The red is the blood. I'm not really all that creative. So red is blood. The liver is the liver-shaped thing that says liver. The muscle is the striated balloon. The fat is here. The central nervous system is the thing that looks like a brain. Um, this is the intestine. I'm not really very good at that. Um, this is your pancreatic islet cells. And the idea is that after you eat a meal, um, and I've always been hoping to be sponsored by people who make Cheerios, but to no avail. Um, your blood sugar, and your blood sugar in this case is represented by green hexagons because glucose begins with G, green. I'm not creative at all in this regard. Um, is your blood sugar goes up. Um, in response to that, the pancreas produces insulin. So here's the pancreas producing insulin, which as everyone knows is a purple rhomboid. Um, and that <laughs> insulin, binds to receptors on the liver, and it binds to receptors on the muscle, and it binds to receptors on the fat. Um, and what's supposed to happen is that in response to that, glucose is taken up from the blood into the fat cells and stored. Uh, it's supposed to be taken up uh, from the blood into the muscle cells and stored, and it's supposed to kind of shut off the liver. The problem is, is that as people become more obese and generally become more insulin resistant, that doesn't work very well. Um, there isn't really much uptake into the fat. There isn't much uptake into the muscle. The liver doesn't turn off. And over time, people's blood sugar rises, which puts them at risk for diabetes. 
Um, the pancreas is a smart organ, smarter than it's given credit for, uh, and in response to uh, this lack of effect, it produces more insulin, um, and that insulin binds to receptors on all these cells. And if you, know, if you knock on the door and nobody answers, if you knock on the door harder with more insulin, um, you can drive the glucose into the muscle, and you can drive the glucose into the fat, um, and you can turn off the liver um, as long as you can produce a lot of insulin. And so one of the things that is becoming more clear is as long as people can produce a lot of insulin, they're not going to get diabetes. They'll have prediabetes, but they won't get diabetes until their pancreas fails to keep up. Once you start to lose that capacity to make these large amounts of insulin, that's when you tip over from prediabetes to overt diagnosed type 2 diabetes. So thank you for showing the data on the DPP. This is the Rosetta Stone, if there is such a thing, of diabetes prevention. Um, we talk about this all the time. We will continue to talk about this. Uh, this figure has probably been reproduced a thousand times in various review papers, uh, and it shows a couple of things. One is that if you look over the course of this four-year intervention um, and look at the cumulative incidence of diabetes, so the percent of the population who got diabetes by the end of the trial, um, one thing is it's really, really high. Um, that's almost 40% of the people. So you take people with prediabetes, follow them for four years, and 40% of them end up with diabetes. So this is really a high-risk group. It's not just a little bit of a high-risk group. These are people who really are going to develop diabetes for the most part, and it's not going to be that far along. Uh, the drug metformin worked really, really well. Um, Bristol-Myers Squibb was very happy, um, but not as well as this lifestyle group, which worked much better than metformin. Um, there was a fourth group, which did get stopped early. That was a TZD drug, which actually beat both those by far, way better than the lifestyle group, um, stopped after a year and a half because the drug, Resilin, had, uh, was causing liver problems, so uh, could no longer be kept in the study. But interestingly, there's another drug in here that was actually beating both the metformin and the lifestyle pretty convincingly. Um, and again, the idea was uh, 150 minutes of exercise a week with a goal to lose 7% uh, of body weight. And, it's, uh, and it worked really well. So I'm going to show this figure uh, several many times um, that overall, from what we've seen so far, uh, you have metformin as a potential to mediate or have a beneficial impact on metabolic health, prevent diabetes. Um, uh, some of that's through weight loss. Metformin does cause small amounts of weight loss. Uh, some of it's probably direct. And then there's this lifestyle change. This is the old um, logo being used by the uh, uh, Thank you, USDA. Um, and I liked it better than the new one. The new one is the plate with the colors um, because this one had the person doing physical activity. The new one does not include that at all, which I find uh, from being from kinesiology kind of disgraceful, so I still use the old one. Um, and part of that is mediated again through weight loss um, as shown by the weight loss in the diabetes prevention program. One of the interesting things is how that weight loss was manifested. So if you look at um, what happened over time in the whole group. Um, so here's their initial weight. Here's what happened after six months. They lost about seven kilos, um, and then over time gradually crept back up. So by the end of the trial, the mean weight loss in this lifestyle group, group was pretty unimpressive as a number. It was about three, less than three and a half kilograms. So one, yes, they did lose a lot of weight, but no, most of them didn't sustain it and yet they still had a great improvement in their transition to diabetes. So there's something about small amounts of weight loss that seem to be important. Um, second, and you can either be depressed about this or not, they were able to maintain their uh, more active lifestyle of around 150 minutes of activity a week, meaning, yay, exercise is a great way to prevent diabetes, and boo, exercise is a terrible way to maintain weight loss, or at least this amount of exercise is a terrible way to maintain weight loss. So the depressing part is 150 minutes a week of exercise seems to prevent diabetes, doesn't seem to be all that effective in terms of weight loss or even the maintenance of weight loss. So the outcomes matter, you know, what the exercise prescription is, and people always ask this, how much exercise should I do? And I always give a typical academic answer. That depends. <laughs> it depends on what, what are you trying to prevent? What are you trying to accomplish? If you're trying to prevent diabetes, I can give you an answer. If you're trying to lose weight, I can give you a different answer. If you're trying to prevent cardiovascular disease, I can give you a di different answer. If you're trying to prevent depression, we can give you a different answer. So 
the answer depends on what your goal is and what the outcomes are. Um, and unfortunately, you know, blanket recommendations don't, accom or don't accommodate that kind of nuanced thinking very well. People want to know, tell me what I should do, which is when I meet with my financial counsel, I know exactly what they mean. She talks for hours about things that have no interest to me, and all I want her to tell me is, what should I do? <laughs> What's going to be on the exam? <laughs> So one of the things we know from uh, a series of good, uh, strong studies is that if you do exercise training, and I'm just picking one in particular, Joe Homard's study from a few years ago, is even if there's no weight loss, even if you put people on exercise training programs and they don't lose any weight at all, or in this case, less than two kilograms, you still see these big improvements in insulin sensitivity and uh, presumably diabetes prevention. So the weight loss is important, but not absolutely necessary. The exercise training works without the need for really any weight loss. So you can sort of complicate this picture a little bit uh, by putting in, uh, yes, the lifestyle change does have a weight loss component, which has a beneficial impact, but there's some part of being habitually active that seems to have a direct effect that isn't necessarily mediated by weight loss. People who are physically active have a lower risk for diabetes, lower risk for cardiovascular disease, even if they haven't lost an ounce of body weight. You can even uh, do this, to break it down further to what happens each time someone exercises. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite studies of all time, now 30 years old. Um, and what Greg Heath took a group of highly trained cyclists and triathletes, measured their insulin sensitivity, their insulin response to a uh, big glucose challenge, um, which is sort of a good indication of your physiologi physiological um, capacity to handle uh, carbohydrate intake. Um, then he stopped them from exercising for 10 days. Um, and that's the miracle, is how do you get people who are cyclists and triathletes to actually stop exercising for 10 days? And the answer is they were all people in his lab, and so he had some control over them. Um, <laughs> because otherwise, these are almost impossible studies to do. You cannot get people who are habitually active like this to give up 10 days of exercise. Um, and then the clever part um, is that he then had them go out and do one bout of exercise and then measure them again the next day. So what he found, and in this case, higher numbers are bad. Um, so in the active, typically active condition, the amount of insulin they secreted after this meal was 117 microunits per ml, which is an irrelevant uh, number. After 10 days without training, it goes up a lot. So 10 days without training actually really made them less insulin sensitive. They're still lean, they still look like athletes, and yet without exercising for 10 days, uh, they seem to have lost a lot of this sensitivity they had uh, 10 days earlier. And then the part that was really clever, you give them one bout of exercise and the next day, almost all of it comes back. So there's an effective exercise that happens each time you do it over and above this sort of training effect. And this is the part of the message that I think has been translated very poorly to the public. Um, who I think all understand the value of going out and exercising regularly as sort of an adaptation, but not the value of each individual bout of exercise to actually cause changes, which you can measure right then um, and for the next 24 to 48 hours. So uh, we sort of summarize this as much of the exercise effect is really due to the residual action of individual exercise bouts. Yes, there's an adaptation to long-term training, but a lot of the effect is happening because you did the exercise and for several hours afterward. Which starts to sound uh, a lot like um, a drug in the sense that here it is, this acute bout of exercise. Um, yes, there's some effect. If you do it 100 times, you get an exercise training effect, but there's also some benefit you get each time you actually do the exercise. So this is what got us thinking 12 years ago um, of exercise as a drug. Um, that at a sufficient dose, uh, exercise improves metabolic function for some period of time, just like every other drug. There's some effect it has for 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever it is. But the effect wanes and requires subsequent doses. If you don't keep taking the medication, the effect wears off. Uh, and that's what got us thinking that if that's the case, if exercise works like a drug, you take it, it has an effect, then it wears off, don't we want to try to tailor the dose to get the maximal effect? Don't we? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we be trying to tailor the dose to get the maximal effect, just like every other drug? The other advantage of thinking about it this way, and this happened, I gave a talk to the endocrine group at uh, the medical school 
12 years ago or so. I talked about exercise. They looked at me like I was from Venus. Uh, then they asked me questions. I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, and then I went back a couple of years later and started talking about exercise uh, as a drug. Um, Meaning, you know, what's the threshold to get the effect? What's the frequency? What's the intensity that you need? What's the duration? What are the interactions with food? And what are the interactions with other medications? And suddenly, we were talking the same language. Suddenly, the uh, endocrinologist and I actually could communicate with each other because we were speaking a common language um, that both of us understood, finally. So what do we know about the least effective dose? Because that's what most people really want to know, is not what's the most exercise I could possibly do to get the effect. It's what's the least exercise I can do to get the effect. And this is where there are really strong epidemiological studies and really weak experimental studies. The epidemiologists have done their job. Uh, we haven't done a great job of following up with the appropriate experimental studies because they're really hard to do. Um, so this study that came out now uh, more than 10 years ago showed that with 120 to 240 minutes a week of physical activity, um, your risk for, in this case, I think it was premature death, but it could be cardiovascular disease, uh, goes down by 30%, which is a big number. Uh, in the DPP, as we talked about, 150 minutes a week seemed to be sufficient um, to really dramatically uh, prevent the transition to diabetes. Um, Sorry, this was actually type 2 diabetes. But this is specific to diabetes prevention. And again, that least effective dose is going to be different for diabetes prevention, cardiovascular disease prevention, uh, depression, weight loss, uh, maintenance of weight loss. All those outcomes are going to have different exercise prescriptions, um, which is, again, one of the reasons that doing the experimental studies could take us decades to do all the individual studies we'd need to do to get all these answers. So just as an example to show you, this is a study from John Jakisic that came out oh, more than 10 years ago. He took a group of, it was all women, a large group of people, um, had them all go through a weight loss program, and then looked at how that weight loss was maintained on different levels of physical activity. So here's 150 minutes a week, like the DPP. This did not work. Um, six months, they lost uh, seven kilos. But like the DPP, uh, they drifted up over time. Uh, give them more exercise, somewhere between 150 and 200, and they did a little bit better. Again, slow creeping up, but not as bad. Uh, but you look at a group getting more than 200 minutes a week, and they're flat. They're basically maintaining the weight loss. So there definitely are different doses with different effects. And whether you're talking about diabetes prevention, uh, that may be sufficient. When you're talking about weight maintenance, it's going to require more than that. And again, this is where blanket guidelines to the public get dicey because this starts to get what many people would say is too complicated for the public to understand, that there are these different recommendations for these different diseases, and it depends on kind of what you're trying to prevent, and it probably depends on your family history and your genetics and your epigenetics, and um, so we're not really sure, which is really our academic answer to almost everything. It depends. <laughs> Uh, so we know a little bit about frequency. Uh, I won't talk much about this. I'm just giving one example that uh, in this case, this is looking at what happens to your insulin concentrations uh, one day after exercise, good. Three days after exercise, still maintained, not maintained, five days after exercise. And a lot of this depends on what people have eaten uh, in the intervening time. But the take-home message is this effect of exercise, and this was a lot of exercise, um, lasts somewhere between one and three days. 24 hours probably, depending on how much exercise you did and what you ate afterwards, maybe it's up to 72. But it kind of tells us that for people to achieve metabolic benefits, they should be exercising at least every other day. Um, because otherwise, the effect wears off, which is, again, like every other drug in the world. Um, what about the duration? Let's forget about the duration. More duration is better. <laughs> so. Here's a study, and I just want to highlight this one uh, for, to look at the intensity, because now there's a lot of interest in exercise intensity. High intensity interval training has become you know, kind of sweeping the world as the answer to all of health issues is, no, people don't have time to exercise, so we're going to bundle this exercise into these very high intensity units um, where you can get the benefit of 40 or 50 minutes of exercise a day in just six to eight minutes of very high intensity training, um, which so far, the studies are, re are reasonably positive in terms of the metabolic benefits. It does seem to work. The problem is, has anyone ever tried to do high-intensity interval training? It's really hard. 
Um, <laughs> it's really, really hard, even for people who are pretty well trained. It's really um, going to be a interesting to see how you can get people who are not trained to do something that is phenomenally difficult. Yes, it's a short amount of time, but it's really difficult. So in this study, this was an inpatient study done in women who are insulin resistant and actually had mild type 2 diabetes. It was done at San Francisco General Hospital, and the idea was control the, durate, control the amount of calories that they're burning, but manipulate the intensity and the duration. So in one case, uh, don't give them any exercise at all. In another case, have them burn 750 calories, but do it at a low intensity, three sort of slow, low intensity bouts of walking. In another case, burn exactly the same amount of calories, but do it at a high intensity. So same calorie expenditure in one case, long and slow, in one case, short and fast, and see if the intensity matters in terms of how it affects their ability to regulate blood sugar. So these are the results. Um, and what it shows, and in this case, this is an infusion uh, into a vein of glucose and insulin. Uh, the lower the concentration of glucose, the better. It means the more effective the insulin is at driving the glucose out of the blood and into the muscle. So here's no exercise, um, and here's high intensity exercise. And if I didn't show it to you, you wouldn't be able to see that the low intensity exercise is the same. So apparently, um, there is a big effect of exercise, but it didn't matter, at least in this study, whether it was high intensity or low intensity. Uh, exactly the same effect if the amount of calories burned was the same. So here in talking about study design, and I loved uh, how the discussion in the last talk came around to, you know, if you control for this, then you don't control for that. If you try and control the amount of time you do the intervention, then you have a difference in the way you uh, deliver it. All these things become important. So here's a question. You have a no exercise condition, and then you have a condition where the women get burned 750 calories over the course of two days. What do you do to their diet? Do you give them back the 750 calories and make them eat those 750 calories back or not? You could argue either one. I mean, in one case, you could say, well, you want to look at the effect of, you know, of the exercise. Why would you feed them the calories back? And the answer is, well, if you want to understand what the exercise did, then you should feed them the calories back because otherwise now you have an energy deficit. And we know that energy deficits, cause, you know, if people are under eating, that has effects on metabolism. So do you feed them the calories back or not? And in this case, the researchers, even though they knew that they were confounding, there was a confounding variable of energy deficit, they did not feed them the calories back. Uh, and I know this because this was my PhD work. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we did not feed the calories back. And the reason is, there's a good reason and a bad reason. Um, the good reason is, you could argue it either way. I mean, there's either way you're, you're uh, changing uh, the experimental design. If you feed them the calories back, they're also getting more carbohydrate, more protein, more fat, so you're introducing another confounding variable by giving them more food, but if you don't feed them the calories back, now you're introducing this confounding variable of they're in an energy deficit. They're not getting as many calories as they burned. Second, I knew that if we didn't see an effect of the exercise, I was never going to be able to publish this. So. Uh, <laughs> I wanted it to work, um, you know, and so by not feeding the calories back, I knew at least the exercise would work. I didn't know which one would work better, but if this doesn't work and these two uh, in conditions end up being the same, now I've done a dissertation with nothing to publish. So there is always a sort of uh, less uh, generous reason to do things, and this was a practical reason. It had to work. Um, so we didn't feed them the calories back, and all I can say in my defense is, at least it bothered me. <laughs> so a few years later, uh, right situation, right funding, uh, right grad student, uh, Colonel Steve Black, who came to work with me on his PhD for a few years on loan from the Air Force, um, who really got interested in this question. Is it really exercise, or is it the calorie deficit you get when you exercise? How important is that calorie deficit? So he did a study, which I'm only going to talk about briefly, um, and took 16 men and women, divided them into two groups of an energy deficit group and an energy balance group. We did seven days of weight maintenance, where we gave them every bit of food they had to eat and measured every single calorie they burned. So the advantages of epidemiological studies is you have a really big sample size and a lot, and you can control for a lot of confounding variables. 
We don't have that luxury. Instead, because we use small sample sizes, we have to control every possible thing we can think of to reduce as much variability as we can. And so we have a saying. Are you recording this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have a saying, which of course I would never say to the dean or to the human subjects committee, um, that we study people but treat them like animals. And <laughs> what I mean is, we control them the same way if you were doing a study on rats in a cage, we try to control everything, what they eat, uh, where they go, how much energy they're burning, um, literally make every meal and deliver it to them so that we know exactly what went into their uh, bodies. And it's the only way you can do studies with small sample sizes. Uh, then he went through and measured insulin action, which is a, an infusion we do to measure how effectively the insulin drives glucose or blood sugar out of the blood and into the muscle. Uh, put them through six consecutive days of exercise, an hour a day on the treadmill at 60% of their maximal oxygen consumption, uh, and then measured it again. And our idea was we thought that the energy deficit would matter, that there would be a better response if they got the energy deficit than the balance. And the way we did the balance was they burned 500 calories a day exactly, not approximately, exactly. When we measured 500 calories of oxygen consumption, we stopped. And then we gave this group 500 calories of food back, and we didn't give this group the food back. So in one case, um, we've got, uh, here's the one group, they're in an energy deficit of minus 480 calories a day, or approximately 500, and this group is approximately an energy balance. Um, it's only six days, so they don't, that's like, they're not gonna lose a lot of weight. Um, this group didn't lose any weight. This group, I'm not gonna say 0.6 kilograms is even measurable. That's within the variability of when you step on the scale. Um, but we achieved what we wanted to. One group got the calories back and was in balance. One group didn't get the calories back. They're in deficit. And again, we thought that the deficit would matter. Um, we provided them all the food, uh, et cetera. Don't worry about that. This is, I hate this slide, but I keep promising the person who made it that I would keep showing it. Um, that <laughs> basically shows that we infuse, um, all right, I will talk about it, um, infuse glucose and a glucose stable isotope into one arm and take blood samples from the other, and then we're measuring using gas chromatography and mass spectrometry, the ratio of isotope to non-isotopically labeled glucose, which is, uh, is able to tell us how much of that blood sugar gets taken out of the blood and up into the muscle quantitatively, you know, per, you know, per minute. We know, I have a dynamic view of how much glucose is taken out of the blood per minute. Um, so this is what we found, and just to remind you, this is a measure, there's a lot of measurements uh, that, but I'm only going to talk about one, how fast glucose is being taken up by the muscle, which is, so higher is good. So here's the deficient group, uh, here's what they looked like before we did the six days of exercise, big increase after, yay, the exercise worked when you did the caloric deficit as well. Surprising to us, when we took away the caloric deficit, nothing happened. It was like they hadn't even done the six days of exercise, which was actually hard to explain to them. Yes, you exercised for six days, and it accomplished nothing. Um, <laughs> thanks for your participation. <laughs> uh, that really surprised us. We thought it would blunt the effect. It would be a less of an effect. We didn't think it would completely remove the effect. Um, and this is what we found in a whole series of measurements that we took, um, including liver glucose production and uh, some of the cardiovascular uh, biomarkers. So. Uh, so fortunately, or unfortunately, when we went to publish this paper, the reviewers of the paper were happy to give us other interpretations uh, of what we found, uh, and, and they were right, at least in one respect. Because one problem is that if you give people more calories, because you're feeding them back these calories, you also have to give them more carbohydrate, protein, and fat. There's no way around that. So the carbohydrate content of the two diets is different. There's just no way around that. If you're going to give them more food, you have to give them more something. So uh, the deficient group got 330 grams of carbohydrate per day. The balanced group got 410 grams of carbohydrate per day. And the reviewers were happy to tell us that could matter. And we were happy to, not so happy to agree, you're right, that could matter. Uh, fortunately, I mean, the paper was published anyway, but that was another thing that we had to think about. Um, and the practical implication of this um, is that, one, we had to do two more studies, one looking at the effect of carbohydrate, and a second looking at the effect of the timing. So another sample, uh, sort of design issue, me and my grad students, we argued for hours about, okay, we're going to give this group the calories back. When? When do we give them back the calories? We're making them exercise for an hour. 
Do we give them the calories back slowly throughout the day? Do we give them the calories back right afterward? I wanted to give them the calories back while they were exercising. Um, <laughs> because I thought, if we're trying to prevent an energy deficit, then we should really prevent an energy deficit. We should give them the calories back while they're on the treadmill. And the grad student said, that's stupid. <laughs> um, so we compromised and gave them the calories back right after they exercised. So this sounds like a Gatorade commercial, right? <laughs> you have to refuel after you exercise. And it's true. If you're LeBron James or you're Kevin Durant, or, you know, that is very important. After exercise, you give people carbohydrate, and it quickly replenishes the glycogen in their muscles and allows them to perform the next exercise bout. Of course, if you're not exercising for performance, if you're exercising for health, this is exactly the wrong thing to do. What we did was we really probably magnified the effect of the calories by giving them back right after exercise. I don't know if, I'm not saying we did it right or we did it wrong, but there's no question that what we did in terms of timing influenced what we found um, and probably really uh, accentuated the effect of calories. Um, and again, when should we have done it? I don't know. We could have given them 10 calories every 20 minutes over the course of the day. Um, I don't know when we should have done it. Um, so the picture keeps getting more and more complicated um, in the sense that now we have weight loss and exercise training and acute exercise, but now the timing of the food, the energy balance, and the meal carbohydrate uh, all contribute as well. So the picture just gets getting murkier and murkier, or in my case, more and more job security. Uh, so the part of that is, uh, I wanted to get to is that no question that exercises reduces the risk for almost every major disease. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Uh, and it has few negative side effects besides, you know, usually you have more sprains, you have more musculoskeletal injuries in an exercise group than not because if you're not exercising, you're not nearly as at risk um, for musculoskeletal injury as if you are. Uh, the problems, one, most people actually hate exercise, and one of the, certainly one of the issues in my field, in my department, is that we are a group of people who tend to like exercise and have a hard time understanding that most people don't. Um, there's a fundamental disconnect between people uh, like me and 99% of the world. Um, so one of the things we have to get uh, understand better is that most people hate exercise and that need to be motivated to do it and don't just find time or make time to do it. And second, as I pointed out, exercise in general is not a great tool for weight loss. It's a tool for weight loss, but without calorie change and diet change, it's not really all that effective, particularly in women. Uh, and we've done studies looking at energy regulating hormones and appetite and the response to exercise in men and women, and it's fundamentally different for reasons that people can argue with in terms of evolution and preservation of body fat and reproduction. But there's no question that women and men respond differently. And that difference is either interesting if you're a man or frustrating if you're a woman. <laughs> so this got us uh, uh, <laughs> thinking about, uh, and there's a lot of interest in uh, this sort of paleolithic lifestyle, uh, or has, has recently been termed the paleo fantasy, um, that uh, all our problems would be solved if we just went back to moving and eating like our uh, paleolithic ancestors. Um, and it's no question that people have looked at, you know, what happens in terms of at, uh, occupations that occupations used to require, and in some cultures still do require, a lot of physical activity. Um, you know, so most people, or many people, used to be physically active at work. Uh, and that has become less true for most occupations. So that uh, now, if you look at the data on office workers, um, overall, office workers sit for a majority of the workday um, with good data showing that for most people, it's more than six hours of sitting per day. So most people, in the United States at least, have a sedentary job that requires, maybe requires, uh, a lot of sitting. We know from studies that have been now more than 50 years uh, old that there's a difference between people who sit all day and people who don't. This is the famous bus driver study of uh, uh, 1953. Uh, ticket takers on, on London buses, if you, uh, I don't know how somebody thought to do this uh, so early on, that uh, the ticket takers on buses who walked around collecting tickets had half the rate of heart attack as the people who sat and actually drove the buses. So huge effect that you could see on London buses just by looking at the people who had to walk around and collect tickets versus the people who never walked around because they were the drivers. Um, 
And that uh, study has been now, I wouldn't say replicated, but um, a lot of confirmatory evidence has come from all sorts of uh, good epidemiological studies showing that your time spent inactive, uh, mostly meaning sitting, um, is directly correlated, strongly correlated with cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, premature death, um, et cetera. And again, this is not brand new. If you look in the literature, uh, this is from 1967, um, a good paper uh, showing that inactivity is a major factor in adult obesity. Um, this, of course, to most of our undergraduate students and even some of my graduate students is might as well never have been written because it's in 1967 and it's not available free online, so it does not exist. The only studies that exist are the ones that are available online and free. If there's no free access, it was never written, it was never done. Um, so in terms of you know, how our groups can intersect, this is a problem I would love to get a better handle on, is how we can make this literature more accessible to a group of people who seem to think that if, it, if they can't immediately download it, that it doesn't exist. We'll talk. Okay, we'll talk. <laughs> um, so that led us to the question of instead of adding exercise, is there value to subtracting sitting? Uh, so we did a, a study, this was actually um, Brooke Stevens' uh, doctoral work along with Kirsten Granado's master's work where she took 14 men and women, um, all of them actually relatively young, healthy people, normally active college and grad students, gave them three conditions in a balanced order, and in one case, they were active all day long. You know, we had them come in and basically made them walk around, stand, uh, they didn't do any exercise, but they, were, they did not sit for basically 15 hours. Um, they sat a little bit, but very little. Mostly they were standing, um, ambling about. Uh, in another case, we had them come in and actually sit for 15 hours, literally sit for 15 hours. We even uh, used a wheelchair to get them to the bathroom. Um, and we didn't change their diet, so now they're getting way too many calories relative to how many they're burning. And then, because we were really interested in, is it really the sitting that's the problem, or is it the fact that if you're sitting, you're also overeating because you're burning so few calories that's the problem? We did exactly the same thing, sat for 15 hours, but now we cut their energy uh, in to match their low energy out. We cut back on their diet, so now they're not burning many calories, but we're not feeding them many calories either, so that we match the amount of calories to try and separate, is it sitting that causes this problem, or is it the associated dietary excess that causes this problem, or both? The answer is always both. So just to uh, give you a little bit, here's the active control condition. Um, they're taking in, or their intake is 3,100 calories a day. They're burning about the same. Their balance is approximately zero. In the inactive condition where we didn't cut their calories, they're in a big energy excess. They're still eating 3,100 calories, but now they're only burning 2,200. So they're almost 1,000 calories over. Uh, and then in the other condition, we basically cut back their energy intake so that it matched their expenditure, and now they're not burning many calories, but they're also not eating many calories. The problem with a study like this is if we send them home at the end of the day and then measure them the next morning, it ruins everything. What if they go home and play basketball? What if they go home and walk somewhere? What if they go home and don't do what we want them to do? So we turned one of the rooms in the lab into uh, what we call the penthouse, even though it was in the basement. We put in a futon, we put in a dresser, we put in a mirror, and we basically had people sleep overnight in the lab. Um, that would be fine, except that it also meant that somebody had to oversee them. So Kirsten and uh, Brooke spent 42 nights sleeping in the lab to basically babysit our human participants who we had to, we can't let them go. We, we have now you know, made these really great controlled conditions, sitting, not sitting, we can't let them leave, um, or we're gonna lose the control over their lives. <laughs> so uh, they slept in the lab, we provided all the food, again, this is why you can't do studies like this with 150 people, even though we'd love to. <laughs> um, and just to give you a visual representation, here's the active condition, uh, the blue is sitting, uh, the red is standing, the green is actually sort of ambulating or stepping, and then the purple is sleeping. So a lot of standing and a lot of stepping, very little sitting. Here's the inactive condition, um, <laughs> sitting, sleeping. That right there, the rings of Saturn, is all the movement that they did, uh, and exactly the same in this condition, except we gave them many fewer calories. So we really tried to control, really make these big differences between conditions, and you could argue, and probably somebody after will say, this is unrealistic. Nobody sits for 16 hours a day. 
And my answer would be, I don't agree. <laughs> um, but second, yes, it's true that most people don't sit for 16 hours a day. What we're trying to do is see what, what happens if you do? What's the, what are the limits of this? If we perturb the system as much as we can, what do we see? Is this really a big problem or not? Then we'll worry about trying to turn it, you know, apply it to a real life office environment. So what Brooke found uh, is that uh, this is insulin sensitivity. The green is the active control condition. In this case, again, higher is better. Um, big decrease with just one day. So this is one day. This is one day, 16 hours of sitting, measured the next morning, 39% lower insulin sensitivity. Not as bad if you cut back the calories, it was only 18%. So there's a portion of both. The sitting seems to matter. The uh, calories seem to matter. Um, they seem to be additive um, in the sense that you don't get as big a problem or as big a diminishment if you also cut back their calories. So I'm not going to talk about that one, but is there potential uh, to improve public health by subtracting sitting um, instead of or in addition to promoting this exercise, exercise, physical activity message, is there also some benefits to uh, promoting the idea that people should not be sitting in chairs as much? And certainly the media have run with this. Um, in terms of standing workstations and treadmill desks and all these other bells and whistles, um, and in fact, as usual, have gotten far ahead of the data in terms of, does this really work? <laughs> because uh, right now there's a perception that all you need to do um, is stand at work or work on this treadmill desk and it will solve all these metabolic problems. We don't actually have great data on what happens in people who stand at work or, or work on treadmill desks. So what we're really interested in is uh, what happens in this condition? How does less sitting compare with these people? And I know about these people because I am these people. You sit all day at work in the morning, you go out and run for an hour at lunch, you sit all day in the afternoon, and then do the same in the evening. So by all standards, I am physically active um, at, one, at the highest level. But I spend, I sit for 15 or 16 hours a day. So does the fact that I'm doing all this sitting, is that diminishing the effects I'm getting? Not me, that's actually somebody else, of course. Um, <laughs> Uh, exercise, this is something we really are interested in, is if you had your choice, um, which one works better? Is less sitting really as good as doing exercise? And we're actually in the middle of a study um, looking at that right now. So in conclusion, um, at a sufficient dose, exercise or physical activity, and we can argue about the difference between the two, uh, is a potent counter countermeasure to cardiometabolic disease. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, there are important interactions between exercise and the nutritional context, and what people eat, when they eat it, and the composition of what they eat is really, uh, really makes a difference, and is really important to consider that exercise doesn't occur in a vacuum. The interactions with food matter, and the interactions with other medications. So we've spent eight years studying, because like other people, we looked at that diabetes prevention program trial and said, ooh, metformin is good, lifestyle is good. I wonder what would happen if we put them together. Um, and so for eight years, we've been publishing papers on the interactions between exercise and the drug metformin and finding to our initially shock, but now less shock, they don't actually work very well together. And that exercise and metformin is not as good as exercise alone every time we measure it. Um, so, which has been a very interesting finding that has not been received completely well in the clinical uh, world. But I'm gonna get to argue with them again at the American Diabetes meeting next week. Um, <laughs> And you know, so far, I'd say the evidence is, and the evidence is not great, that reduced sitting by itself is useful, but it's likely not sufficient by itself. That if people really want to achieve metabolic benefits, less sitting is useful, but probably not sufficient. Um, there's probably going to be a need to also include more physical activity of a sort of moderate to vigorous intensity. So uh, I sort of put this all together into one uh, package, um, the lifestyle component, which involves nutrition, which involves habitual activity, which involves the effects of each individual dose, and also, I think that should be a, that's better, um, <laughs> less sitting, uh, and also this pharmacological part, which, you know, in the interactions between exercise and pharmacology is the Wild West. We don't know anything, really, about how exercise interacts with 
the medications you may have seen just 10 days ago, my friend John Tifo got a lot of exposure in the New York Times with his study showing that statins uh, really block the effects of exercise training uh, on blood lipids. So there's a lot of potentially negative interactions between exercise and these ridiculously common medications like metformin and statin drugs. So uh, a lot of people have helped with this. These are the people who've been in the lab throughout the years, including the current group. Uh, and we've been, until recently, fairly lucky to receive uh, pretty good funding, uh, although I also have grants which are not being funded. Welcome to, yes. <laughs> it's a very exclusive club, meaning all of us <laughs> are writing grants that aren't being funded. Um, and thank you very much. Yes. is that if you take a single bout of exercise in somebody who is taking metformin, the effects on uh, their insulin sensitivity are not as strong as the exercise alone. We did it again with 12 weeks of exercise training, and this is all in people with prediabetes, and found exactly the same thing. The exercise training by itself was really effective. You add the metformin, less effective. Um, we found the same thing on cardiovascular fitness, that the exercise training is not as effective if you add metformin. We think we have a handle on why that might be, but we're still trying to chase it down. Is it a published article? Yes, we have, uh, I think we now have six metformin and exercise papers, and I'm happy to give you access to all of them. <laughs> The latter. So the exercise and metformin wasn't as good as the exercise alone, but it was better than metformin alone. So the exercise adds to the effect of metformin, but the metformin doesn't add to the effect of exercise. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I wonder if you could speak to this concept of how if you do the same exercise day after day, that you could become kind of less efficient in terms of how many calories you're burning and what you can get out of it. Is that true? Yeah. yeah, so the question is, um, if you do the same exercise over time, you'd become, I think, more, effi uh, more efficient, but I know what you mean, right? So you get better at it, you uh, have less wasted motion, um, and so you actually burn fewer calories, and I think it, it's true. I mean, uh, cycling is a great example. If you look at a really well-trained cyclist, they are using many fewer calories to just turn the pedals than, than you are. They are really, really efficient. So that as you do the same kind of activity, naturally, you, you're, you have less extraneous movement, you become smoother, you burn fewer calories at it. The best example is looking at people who really have played Wii games for a long time. Um, if you start out, you know, playing, you know, the, the tennis game, you know, you're wailing your arm back and forth and burning hundreds of calories. You look at people who are really good at it, they're doing this. <laughs> you know, so it's true that as you do activities, you do become uh, some more economical and probably burn fewer calories. You know, is it enormous? Is it 50%? Probably not. But there definitely is value to people doing a variety of activities to kind of keep from getting too economical, too efficient at any one. Um, I think that there, that's true. Is that what you tell people? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, totally agree. <laughs> yes. The question was, uh, I've talked mostly about studies with pre 
looking at people with prediabetes progressing to diabetes. What about people who already have type 2 diabetes? There are a lot of good studies on people who already have type 2 diabetes. There, it's harder to measure because, you know, for a bunch of experimental design reasons, it's a more variable group. Um, the nice thing about prediabetes is they have many of the problems of people with diabetes, except when you bring them in in the morning, their blood sugar is the same on day one as it is on day seven as it is on day 14, whereas if you look at people with diabetes, it isn't. So you're starting with a different baseline every day, which for us experimental people is just really annoying. Um, but the studies that have been done show that exercise is really effective to manage diabetes, and there's even some studies on diabetes reversal, where people who started out the study with diabetes no longer have diabetes. It requires a lot of exercise and a lot of weight loss, um, and you know, it, it's probably not going to work for everyone. Um, people with mild type 2 diabetes who are able to do enough activity and change their body composition enough can at least temporarily probably reverse diabetes. The studies are not as good. Um, but there's no question that exercise is a, it's a cornerstone for diabetes management as well as diabetes prevention. You had a second question? I do. Um, the first speaker talked about the strategic approach. Uh, the second speaker talked about clinical versus the, you know, the, um, the lab measure. Um, and I'm, I'm curious for you or for any of the other speakers, are there things that you're doing so you interact with scientists who are coming from a different background? So you just had an interaction with somebody from a right. different background. And a lot of science desks, you could be, you talk to them and you, you know, there's this personal connection. So, oh, we could actually Right. Uh, oh, it makes a ton of sense. So the question is, you know, in, are there informal and formal mechanisms to bring pe scientists together from different backgrounds to kind of, you know, better inform the decision and, and be able to move, understand the, the problem at a deeper level, do studies at a deeper level? Informally, yes. I mean, I feel like, you know, people always criticize academic scientists for being in silos. I have never found that to be the case. Um, I collaborate with people all over. Um, I collaborate with people in, within the university. I collaborate with people outside this university. I collaborate with people in other countries. I've never found this problem to be as big a problem as people keep saying it is, this silo idea. And maybe it's because our, you know, I come from a hybrid background. I have a biology degree. I have a nutrition degree. I have an exercise science degree. So maybe I'm just naturally kind of collaborative. But I haven't found that. Um, on an individual basis to be the case. Institutionally, it's a problem. Um, and the problem is, starts to fall apart on uh, the way resources are divided, the way credit is given, um, so that even though there's a lot of lip service to interdisciplinarity, when you actually try to do it, it can get hard. So even here on this campus, I want to write a grant with somebody in chemistry. Um, that's fine until we have to figure out, the deans have to figure out, okay, you're writing this grant to NIH, there's gonna be $400,000 in indirect costs, who gets what? Which school, which college gets which, what share? And that's where it starts to fall apart, is that the institutions are designed for departments and colleges and less designed to be able to handle this kind, these kinds of things. You, know, you write a grant to NIH, NIH now luckily has this sort of co-PI, or they don't call it co-PI, it's a, what's the word for the two? Multi-PI, thank you, uh, mechanism, which didn't even exist a few years ago because, you know, it's a big deal. You, the person who's the principal investigator basically gets all the money and all the glory, and everybody else is just a co-investigator who really gets, you know, the scraps. So it's really hard to collaborate with somebody, uh, especially in a different discipline, knowing that somebody is basically going to be the principal investigator and everybody else is not. Um, so now there are, you know, more and more mechanisms to do this. I think that the, at the medical school, that Center for Clinical Translational Science is a phenomenal uh, resource um, to try and do this. But the problem is at the institutional. I don't think the problem is us. I think we are happy to collaborate. The problem is the institutions are behind in terms of fostering those things in an organic way. So the other thing is you can't slam people together and say collaborate. That does not work at all. It has to grow from the questions. You know, I have to seek somebody out because we can do something together. Putting a bunch of people in a room and saying collaborate, I, I've found, is totally useless. <laughs> yes, and it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, deans and other, there are no deans here, right? The deans love this kind of stuff. 
Now look what I'm doing to foster interdisciplinarity. <laughs> right. <laughs> The question is, you know, in, rather than just talking into the academic, let me see if I can paraphrase this, yeah. the academic community, is this uh, being transmitted in a useful way to the community so that the community actually is getting the benefit of the research? Is that close to what you were? And is there community leadership? And community leadership. Uh, yes. I mean, I think that this is, again, a big change or a big push is, you know, more community-based participatory research. There's a lot more money, certainly coming from NIH, for community-based participatory research. And they really do emphasize the participatory part. You know, the uh, you know, the community is supposed to be generating, you know, here are our problems. Um, your solution won't work because you say that you're going to do this study in Springfield to have people do more walking along that uh, path along the river. Well, that's a great idea, except nobody wants to walk along the path along the river because it's perceived as being incredibly unsafe. So that's great that you're telling us to do more walking, but where are we supposed to do this walking? You know, there needs to be some built, in, in built environment infrastructure built into this so that we can actually accomplish it. So I feel like that's happening uh, more and more, and more and more people are involved in working with the community and community leaders, and, uh, and the community leaders taking more ownership of this, and actually, I think, demanding more accountability from the scientific community as well. I don't do a lot of that. Um, I am the first to admit um, that the part about community-based participatory research that drives me crazy is the participatory part. <laughs> I'm not that good at that kind of, what do you mean you want to do it that way? I, I know how to do it. So, but fortunately, that's why there are people who are good at community-based participatory research, and it's not me. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, you know, so what I do is, you know, as I do a lot, try to do a lot of talks like this, I talk at, uh, to people at Cooley Dickinson and Basin. I go to do talks like this to patient groups and especially practitioner groups all the time to try and tell them what I think is going on, what the state of the science is, knowing that they're the ones on the ground who are actually going to be implementing this. So, you know, for me, it's one step removed because I'm not great with the community. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. We're just about out of time, but I did want to ask Barry one last question. And I noticed that you had a couple of sources that probably did not appear in, in electronic indexes and weren't freely available online. And um, I'd like to know how you found them. I mean, that seems particularly relevant. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know if this is a popular answer or not, but I'm a huge fan of interlibrary loan. Yes. I'm all about interlibrary loan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, initially, usually, I mean, we mostly, I mean, PubMed is probably our bread and butter. I mean, that's our sort of go-to uh, environment. Yeah. And then, you know, since I go and I enter it through the library portal, um, then I'm able to, yes, <laughs> you've trained me well over the years. <laughs> um, and then I'm able to figure out, you know, who has this uh, particular uh, journal. And then since, I mean, since we're not a medical campus, it's often not us. It's often you guys. So therefore, I can get it through interlibrary loan. It popped up on PubMed. Um, oh, so, yeah, so it popped up on PubMed, but you know, then when you go to it, and of course, this is what students do, it pops up on PubMed as an abstract, and they can't get the full text, so they say, well, I'll find a different paper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>